so we're so excited to have Pastor Brian, his beautiful wife, Kelly. She's kind of a spiritual daughter to Jeannie and I. And so why don't you give them a big hand, or Pastor Brian a big hand as he comes to share. It is great to see you guys, and uh, thank you, Pastor Doug, uh, for having me here. Uh, like you said, Pastor Doug's been a mentor to mine and one of my best friends, and uh, your pastor. What a way to welcome a guy to a church uh, right there. Um, but how many love your pastor? Y'all give Pastor Doug a big hand. Appreciate Pastor Doug and Jeannie. And uh, so thank you, guys. I'll get to that in a second. But thank, thank you, guys. Uh, for having me here. I uh, also want to just say on behalf of Destination Church, thank you guys uh, for partnering with us and uh, by sending your pastor. Our church, Destination, loves Pastor Doug uh, very much. They're always excited. Sometimes, and maybe you're feeling like this today, sometimes when you have a guest speaker, you're like, man, uh, I wish our, our lead pastor was speaking today. And uh, we love having Doug back uh, so many times because now when Doug comes to preach, people are excited. They remember that he's coming. So thank you uh, for being faithful and sending him to us several times a year. And uh, we love what God is doing here. How many are you ready for the word of God today? Are you ready to, to let God speak to you? I will put that picture back up for a second. I didn't get a chance to see that. Wow, that is, uh, that is impressive. Uh, I could have given you a real one. And then here's what's kind of crazy. Uh, maybe Pastor Doug didn't know this, and maybe if he did know this, he wouldn't have invited me here. Uh, but somewhere in the great state of Missouri, there actually is a real mugshot of myself somewhere. Uh, now, I kind of kind of set this up a little bit. I went to Bible college in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, that's where I met my beautiful wife, Kelly, who's actually from here in Kansas City. And uh, my last year, I was a senior at, at CBC uh, down in Springfield, and my wife moved back here to Kansas City. And I don't know if you've ever done that trip uh, to Springfield, to Kansas City, but almost every other weekend I was doing that trip uh, to come see her. And I loved her so much that I wanted to get here as fast as I could. So uh, over the course of my senior year, I pulled in a couple speed tickets uh, over the course of that time, and I thought they were all taken care of. I thought I had paid them all, thought they were all good. Matter of fact, we graduated, moved to Virginia to become a youth pastor, and uh, this was about, I guess, 13 years ago. It was kind of a week like this. We came to visit uh, my wife's family, and uh, my wife's family's home church actually invited us to speak. So it was a sunny night in Lawson, Missouri. I don't know if you know where that is. It's a pretty small town. I think there's one stop sign in the whole town, and right after church, right after I spoke, I think I rolled the stop sign a little too fast, and I was pulled over by the one policeman. I think he's a volunteer there, but the one policeman uh, that works in Lawson pulled me over, and I thought, oh my goodness, and and so I gave him my license, and before I know it, he said, get out of the car. Uh, there's a warrant for your arrest. He started to handcuff me. My wife, like, went off on this police officer. Says, my, my, this is a, he goes, uh, she, he's a pastor. He just left church. I'll never forget what this officer said. He goes, pastors kill people, too. That's what he said. <laughs> he, he arrested me, put me in, put me in the car, took me to downtown Lawson. Uh, it's pretty a pretty scary place, and I think they actually took a picture of me. Uh, but uh, thank goodness my family, uh, my wife's family actually has a lawyer, so I got out of all of it. I, I was uh, uh, somehow, it was just a misunderstanding, but Pastor Doug, there really is a mugshot of me somewhere. And uh, the saddest day, you talk about the worst days of your life. At that time in our life, we had like literally uh, no money to our name. And I literally had to pay the bail to kind of get out. And uh, so I literally had to sign over the check that the church paid me from preaching right over to the town of Lawson. It was one of the worst days of my life. How many are grateful that God loves us even at our worst days, even at our worst moments? And that's what I want to talk about uh, today. Uh, and here's what I really want to talk about. Uh, you say, now what? I'm caught, so now what? Uh, and here's the truth. The truth is we can't see how much God loves us if we can't see how God sees us. Let me say that again. We can't truly see how much God loves us if we can't see how God sees us. Now, I love the song that you sang this morning, uh, that I am who I, uh, he says I am. And, and I believe that most of us, uh, maybe we sing that song today, uh, many of us actually believe it. The, the problem is that most of us don't live it. Uh, most of us don't really see ourselves how God sees us. See, most of us, we're not living uh, that I am who God says I am. Most of us are living I am who I say that I am. Or maybe we're saying I am who other people say that I am. And the problem is that most of us don't see ourselves uh, the way God sees us. I'll put it up on the screen. Here's my real prayer for today. If I had really just one prayer for every person here is that my prayer today is that you will see you the way God sees you. That you will begin to see you. I love the song that said the scales will fall off my eyes. And, and my prayer is that's exactly what would happen today. Is that God would use his word and use the Holy Spirit today to help you to see yourself the very way that God 
sees you. Now, here's the problem with this is that most people think you see fine. Now, many years ago, I'll never forget, this is probably, I guess, uh, 10 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, uh, we started to have insurance, and our insurance said that I could go to the eye doctor once a year for free. I'm not a doctor person. If you're a doctor, God bless you, uh, but I don't really like to go to the doctor. But my wife says, hey, you need to go to the eye doctor. I said, no, I really don't. She says, well, it's covered, so just go. And so I, I reluctantly went to the eye doctor, and I went through the whole eye exam where they give you different things to see, and you read the little letters, and at the end of the exam, he says, hey, you need glasses, and I said, no, you need glasses. I, I can see fine. He says, no, you really need glasses, and I said, no, I, I promise you I can see fine. He says, just trust me. You really need glasses. Some of you, sometimes we got to trust the doctor, so I, I took the prescription. I got the glasses. I didn't really think that I needed them, uh, but I got in the car and began to drive away. I said, well, I'll just try it out, so I put the glasses on. And, and kid you not, Pastor Doug, I didn't know you were supposed to be able to read the road signs on the interstate. I didn't know you were supposed to be able to see them. And, and for the first time ever, I could see like never before. And, and so how many times, and here's what's really crazy today, is that many of us are driving down the interstate of life, we're going through our life, and we think we can see fine, but we really can't. But we think we can see the road signs, but until you can really see the way God intends you to see, and that's the problem. Many people are living life, even believers, even Christians, uh, who God has changed, they're going to heaven, but they choose to see through natural eyes and see through their eyes instead of looking and viewing our life the way God intended us. So I'm just asking you for the next few minutes today to just, uh, I'm not an eye doctor, but I just as a spiritual maybe guide to give you the word of God, would you just kind of take an exam this morning? I'm not really asking you to do anything differently. I'm just really asking you to maybe just come and see a little differently. How many know seeing is believing? And so sometimes we just got to see something to believe it. And so I want to try to get, just give you a way to say, you know what, maybe just maybe God wants you to see yourself a little bit differently. Because many of us, we see ourselves through our mugshots. Many of us, we identify ourselves um, through our worst moments. We identify ourselves through our past. Uh, maybe we identify ourselves through the words of others or through what we didn't have in our life instead of viewing ourselves through God's eyes. See, when you see inaccurately, you'll make inaccurate decisions on your life. When you can't see the road signs, you won't react to them the right way. I, I love to give you an equation this morning that I love to share with my church, and it really is about your future. At our church, we say where you're going matters, and it really is all about your future not about your past. Well, if your future really matters, then how you see matters. Because let me kind of give you this equation. Whatever you see or how you see determines what you think about. Think about this. Whatever you look at determines your thoughts. And your thoughts or what you think about determine your emotions. So what you see determines your thoughts. Your thoughts determine your emotions. Your emotions determine your decisions. How many know we don't make decisions based on what's right? We make decisions on how we feel. But how our, our feelings ultimately come from how we see and our decisions ultimately determine our future. So if you want to change your future, change how you see. If you want to change where you're going, just change where you're looking. And today when we talk about your life personally, I believe when you begin to see yourself the way God sees you, it will change everything. Now, this is, means a lot to me because I grew up seeing the wrong way. I grew up, uh, uh, even in a Christian home, uh, really viewing myself through the eyes of other people, viewing myself through the eyes of my mistakes. Uh, I, I grew up in middle school, high school, very insecure. Uh, I, if, if you would have told me that several years later, I would stand on stages with microphones in front of people, I, I would have said, you're crazy because I didn't like to talk in front of anyone. Uh, I was I had very low self-esteem, didn't really believe I, uh, anything that I could do something great with my future. Uh, but when I was 17, year old, 17 years old, um, I found God, or I would really say it like this, God found me. And I was really going through a, a tough time in my life, and I'll never forget it. I was in the basement of my house, and I really found, God found me, and, and there was a Bible down there, and I began to open the Bible really for the first time. And, and I found this passage of Scripture. I gave my life to God. God began to change my life, and, and no longer was I just reading the Bible for information. Now it was for transformation. And how many know the Bible sometimes is meant to be prayed, not to, meant to be read? And, and, and I began to look at the Bible a little differently, and I found this chapter, and I want to give it to you today. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Matter of fact, I'm only going to give you about three verses of it. Uh, but this chapter literally changed the way I 
I saw myself. I, I really felt like God wrote this chapter just for me, and, and I love the Bible that way. Sometimes you can be in a service like this with a crowd of people and think that the preacher is preaching right to you, but that's how the Holy Spirit works through his word and through people that speak. And as I began to read this chapter, I felt that God had wrote this chapter just for me, and I felt like it changed my whole view of myself. And so I'm just going to give you three verses, but I challenge you to maybe your homework assignment, go read this chapter on your own. It's found in the book of Psalms written by a guy named David, uh, Psalms 139, and I'll put it up here on the screen, starting in verse number 13. All right, it says this, it says, for you, not somebody else, not, not a friend, not, not your social media friends, but for you, talking to God. Here was David talking to God. He said, for you, God, created my inmost being. Now, I love the next phrase. It says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Now, I don't know if you know anything about knitting. I have no idea. I've never knitted anything in my life, but uh, we have a grandmother. Kelly's got a grandmother who knits all the time, and she makes several things. Here's what I know about knitting. That word knitting has a lot to do with detail. How many know knitting is every single detail? So think about this for a second. I know mom and dad had a part in your creation, but as I read this and as I began to read this, what it said is that God had a much bigger part in my creation, that God literally knit me together. He knit you together. That means every detail, the parts of yourself that you like, the parts that you don't like, the things that you think are great, the things that you try to hide from everyone, God literally knit you together in your mother's womb. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You're exactly who God created you to be. Keep reading. It goes on to say, David, literally, I never saw this until I was 17 and read this. David says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, that, that thing that says that God fearfully made me or God put a lot of thought, a lot of consideration into making me and to making you. And it literally changed the way I thought about things. And that David literally worshiped God. Think about this. He worshiped God not just for who God was. He worshiped God for who God made him. Like, what an amazing way to come in to worship God, that, that you worship God for who you are. And not that in an arrogant way, but in a way of such humility and such honor that God put so much thought and consideration into making you the way he is. Now, don't we serve a great God? This is pretty awesome. I love this. He says, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Keep reading. One more verse. It goes on to say that my frame, the literally bones of my body, were not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place, when I I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Now, I love this, and I highlighted this. I hope you see it. It says, your eyes, your eyes, not my eyes, not my spouse's eyes, not your parents' eyes, not your friend's eyes, not all the people that follow you on Facebook or social media, but God's eyes. How many know God's eyes are the most important eyes to put value on? Your eyes saw my own foreign body. Your eyes saw me. Look, it says there's a colon here, which means the, your eyes is for the next part. Your eyes, listen, all the days ordained for me were made from his eyes. Every day was written in a book before one of them came to be. How many know that God sees you better than everyone else sees you? And we got to start seeing ourselves the way God wants to see you. Here's my one thought for today, or the one thing I'd love for you to know, and we'll put it up here. here here's the thought today, is that we were created to see ourselves through the eyes of our Creator. We were literally created to see ourselves through the eyes of our creator. Now, here's the problem today. I want to kind of get into this, uh, uh, the way that many of us don't see ourselves the right, the right way. Even though we are created to see ourselves through the eyes of our creator, here's the, what I call the crazy problem. We've traded God's eyes for our own eyes. We, we traded God's eyes. Now, I know this because how I many you know this? We, we get up and every morning we look in a mirror first before we look into God's mirror. The Bible says his word is the best mirror that you can look in. But we've traded God's eyes for our own eyes. Matter of fact, we've traded our, our God's eyes for other people's eyes. Many times we will go and, and we care more about what the status of other people say about us than, than what the status that God says. And, and I know you, we care about this. Matter of fact, I want you to turn to somebody beside you right now. Look them in the eye and say, you're looking good today. Come on, tell them. You're looking good. Now tell them this, but I'm looking better. Come on, tell them, but I'm looking, I'm looking better. See, some of you haven't smiled that much all day until you actually heard someone say to you how great you look. We care so much about what other people's opinions. Now, here's the crazy thing about when we trade God's eyes for ours or somebody else's. There are 7 billion people on this planet and not one person is like you. 
Now, many people look at that as a bad way. I'm hoping that you'll see that in a good way. But here's what's crazy. We, we compare ourselves to 7 billion people who you'll never be like. There's not one person on this planet. I don't care if you try to mimic everything they do. You could never be like them, and they could never be like you. And yet we put so much value on the eyes of people instead of the eyes of God. Now, think about this. You're, most of your eyes are on me this morning. Even when people look at you, think about this. We judge a book by its cover. Even, if, even this morning, you can only see, and as people look at you, people can only see, if I put a percentage on it, probably only about 10% of you. Like you can only see about 10% of me. The person beside you can only see about 10% of you. There is so much more to you. How many of you have ever felt like you've been misviewed before? Like people didn't view you the right way and they looked at you because with eyes, we can only see a certain percentage and maybe we can reveal more as we want to. But here's the thing. We put 100% value on what people can only see 10% of. Now, here's what's great. Uh, I serve a God who not only sees everything, he sees 100% of me and likes 100% of me, created 100% of me, made 100% of me. How many think we should value God's eyes way more than the eyes of other people? Now, here's the other problem when we value the eyes of other people. We're going to do one or two things. Uh, and we're going to do this. We're either going to like what we see or we're not going to like what we see. When we compare ourselves to other people, here, here's the two different mindsets that will happen every time and both are wrong. When we compare ourselves to other people, you're going to either think that you are better than what you see or you're going to think that you are worse than what you see. Many people fall in the latter category, but I can say both are wrong. When you compare yourself to other people and you think, man, I'm better than that person, that's wrong. Or when you compare yourself to other people and think, man, I wish I was good, they are better than me. Both those perceptions are wrong, and it leads to what I call the crazy cycle. Now, today I want to give you two diagrams to look at. The first one is what I call the crazy cycle, which is how many people live their life, how many people view themselves. This is why many people not only have a mugshot, but they continue to get a mugshot because they're in a bad cycle of continuing to get caught, continuing to not grow, continuing to not see spiritual growth, because many of us, and we can get saved and give our life to Jesus, but until we change how we see, it will not change where we're going. And so for us to grow, and my prayer is that you will spiritually grow, but for us to grow, we've got to start with how we see, but for us to see, because sometimes we think we see what we don't, let me show you uh, how many people see. Now, I want to give you a diagram this morning. Here's the first part of the diagram is that when you see yourself, and I kind of put a picture of yourself in the middle. Usually if you live your life not through God's eyes, but through your eyes and the eyes of other people, here's the first word that's going to be the result of this cycle. We'll put it up here. It's the word insecure. When you see yourselves, ultimately, when you view yourselves through the eyes of yourself or the other people, it's always going to lead to insecurity. You say, what is insecurity? Insecurity is a place of vulnerability. It's literally the word insecure means you don't feel safe. You, see, you feel vulnerable. There's places in your life or, where you feel exposed. And, and, and many of us, if we don't view our lives through God's eyes, it goes through this. Now, let me ask you this question, and here's kind of the question to ask. Uh, man, am I living this way? Is this a result of how I'm living? Because many people don't view themselves as insecure because it comes out in two different ways. If, if you're living not through God's eyes, through other people, you're putting on a persona of one or two of different personas. I'll, I'll put it up here. here here's the two personas you're going to put on. You're going to put on a persona of weakness or you're going to put out a persona of arrogance. Insecure people always put out one or two of these personas. You're either going to portray weakness to the world, or you're going to portray arrogance. Let me talk about the weakness for a second, because here's the group of people that we obviously can look at and say, man, these people are insecure, uh, because weak people, they view themselves as a doormat. They let kind of everybody walk over them. Uh, weak people, you'll never see weak people in a uh, this, this low self-esteem in a selfie. They're never in a picture by themselves. Matter of fact, they ever make it in a picture it's usually a group picture and they're in the very back they're kind of hiding behind someone uh, they never speak up because they don't think that their their opinions matter and, and they just they're very low self-esteem very insecure and they put out this form of weakness and most of us would look and say yeah that's someone of insecurity I'm, my prayer is that that's how you see yourself that that God would set you free from that today but I would say this many people would say well arrogant people aren't insecure I would argue that arrogant people are actually more insecure than even people that portray 
a weakness. Because arrogant people, matter of fact, arrogant people are the opposite. They're, you're going to see selfies of them every 10 minutes. Come on. On their timeline, every 10 minutes there's a picture of, of themselves. And, and, and to the world, you know what they're portraying? To the world, they're portraying that they love themselves, that they think they're better than other people. Matter of fact, when you see the pictures of these people, your ultimate thought is, man, they just must have it all together. They just really love themselves. And yet the truth is, is that they're so insecure that they don't want anyone to forget who they are. That they feel so invisible that they don't want anyone to forget. They will always puff out their chest to say, I'm here. That instead of doormats, they run over people. They're bullies. They're, they're arrogant. And can I just say, a thing of weakness or arrogance, it's both a wrong way to view yourself. Because let me kind of go back to the crazy cycle. Insecurity. Let me show you the next step of insecurity. It leads to this word right here, fear. Fear. Now, you know, the Bible says God didn't give us a spirit of fear. Yet many people, because you feel unsafe, you literally feel afraid. Now, I don't know if you have anything that you're afraid of. I hate to admit this. Matter of fact, I'm a little insecure about this, especially as a man. But I'm just going to be honest with you and just kind of be upfront with you. I'm scared to death of spiders. I hate spiders. Come on. Anybody else, any, but any other men in the room especially, scared, I, right now, I am scared to death of spiders. My wife knows this. My wife makes fun of me all the time with this. Matter of fact, a couple nights ago, uh, matter of fact, a couple weeks ago, uh, it was getting time for bed and, and and uh, we, in our bedroom, it's kind of this like uh, uh, a vaulted ceiling in our bedroom. And I was getting ready to walk in right before she turns off the lights. We're getting ready to go to bed. She goes, babe, just want to warn you, like up at the vaulted ceiling, you know, springtime is getting a little warmer. Uh, there, there she goes, there's like a baby spider up there. Now, her way of saying that was, hey, just letting you know there's a spider, but we're still going to turn off the lights and go to bed. Listen, I walked in that room and I was petrified. I was frozen. I, I was scared. I, I mean, no, look, I'm not going to bed with that little spider up there because, you know, that thing, when I go to bed, it's going to like see me and zoom down it's going to crawl in my ears it's going to it's going to it's going to plant other spiders and i'm going to be hosting like millions of spiders i'm going to turn into the opposite of spider-man it's going to be awful it's my greatest fear uh, and so i did what any god-honoring husband would do i said babe woman kill the spider kill kill, kill the spider because I can't kill them. I, I'm just literally frozen. She says, babe, it's like in a vaulted ceiling. I said, babe, there is a ladder in the garage. Go do whatever you got to do. She kills the spiders in the house. Listen, a, a grown man can break into my house and I will kill you before you steal my stuff. But if a spider gets in, I mean, I'm frozen. Doesn't that seem absolutely like just crazy? It sounds crazy even saying, I'm not exaggerating the story you can ask her. Like I'm literally petrified uh, of spiders. And it's so funny because it's something so small, but it's something that holds me back so, so big. Matter of fact, because here's what fear leads to. Let me show you the next one. Fear leads to this next one right here. I'll put it up here called paralysis. Now, if you have paralysis in the arm, you know what that means? You can't use the arm. You know what fear always leads to? It leads to you literally being frozen or paralyzed. I was literally in a place where I couldn't move. I was literally in a place that, babe, you've got to go kill the spider. Here's the deal. Because of insecurity, because of fear, fear keeps you from taking steps of faith to God. Fear keeps you from being who God's called you to be. And it literally paralyzes you, not literally in life, but it paralyzes you from doing and being who God called you to be. And you literally stand on the sidelines of life and watch everyone else play the game. And, and many of you have absolutely frozen and, and insecure and it keeps you from, from moving and being who God has called you to be. Matter of fact, fear keeps you from maybe giving your life to God. Maybe fear keeps you from going on a mission trip for the first time. Maybe fear keeps you when you hear Pastor Doug talk about giving or tithing. You're so afraid and you know it's something God's called you to do, but you're literally paralyzed by it. Maybe you're paralyzed from getting in a small group or serving on a team. And, and this idea of being who God's called you to be because there's such insecurity and it leads to such fear. It leads to a place where I call paralysis. And then ultimately, it leads to this last one, which I call incomplete, because that's where many of us are in our life. And the cycle goes on and on and on. Many of us have taken a test before, and maybe it was a multiple choice, and we left something blank, or we left it incomplete. Maybe we knew the right answer, but we were so afraid of getting it wrong that we chose not to get it right. And yet many of us in our life, we stand here today, even as grown adults, many of us, and our life is incomplete. We know there's areas in our life that are missing. There's a puzzle piece. There's an area of our life that we're just not everything God called us 
to be. And it's the crazy cycle that most of us continue to go on. And we give our life to Jesus, and many of us are saved, and we're going to heaven, yet we're living our life every single day, waking up so insecure, so afraid, so paralyzed in who we are, and so incomplete. And the cycle goes on and on and on. And I call this crazy. I think this is a crazy way to live, and I think Jesus came to set us free. How many think there's a better way to see ourselves? There's a better way to live. And so I want to encourage you, as, and then the remainder of this message, I want to show you a better cycle. Matter of fact, here's the one thing to do today, uh, if you're taking notes. I just want you to come see that there's a better way to see you. I, I want you to see that there's a better way to wake up every morning. There's a better way of not to be insecure, not to live in fear, not to be paralyzed, not to be incomplete, but to be complete. Matter of fact, let me kind of show you a better cycle. I'm going to put the picture up here again, but here's the ultimate word. Instead of insecure, God wants you to have confidence. God wants you to wake up every day, not weak, not arrogant, but confidence. You know what confidence is? Confidence is knowing exactly who you are in God. Confidence goes back to seeing yourself the way God sees you. Confidence is like David who can lift his hands and praise God because of who he is, not because of who he isn't, but because who God made him, that God knit me together, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Confidence wakes up every single day and says, you know what? I can do all things, not on my own, but through Christ who gives me strength. I can wake up every single day saying, if God is for me, who can be against me? I can wake up every single day saying that God promised he would never leave me or forsake me. How many know that if you see yourself through the eyes of God, you're going to have a confidence, a confidence like nothing before. That's how God wants you to wake up every day. That's how God wants you to see yourself. That's why God's word is more valuable than your mirror. That's why God's word and what he says is more important than any status or any social media that someone will say or how many likes that you get on a comment or a picture. God likes you. God has something for you. God made you. And it's time that we start walking in confidence and not in security. Now, I, I would wish that we could just wake up one day and be there. And, and, and matter of fact, this isn't the first step. This is the last step. So let me show you the cycle because if you want to get there, you've got to take these steps. Now, instead of walking in fear, here's the opposite of that. Here's the first step on your path to confidence is you got to have faith. It starts with faith. The pathway to confidence starts with faith. And it doesn't start with faith in yourself because that's what got you to that place of insecurity. It starts with faith in God. Matter of fact, if you're not a believer, and I love that you can belong before you believe, but I love what was said today. The first step to getting confident is putting your faith in God, is understanding you are a sinner, is understanding you are caught, is understanding that we've all fallen short. You're going to go through the crazy cycle over and over again until you realize where you are and what God did for you, and you put your faith in a Jesus who lived a perfect life because we can't, a Jesus who died on the cross to pay for the sins you can't pay for, a Jesus who didn't stay in the grave but defeated death, hell, and the grave and is coming back for those who believe we got to put our faith in that Jesus today. You know, I love what 2 Corinthians says. 2 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 7 says that we live by what? We live by faith, not by sight. You say, well, I thought we were supposed to see. See, what Paul is saying is, is that we're not called to live this life through our natural eyes. Matter of fact, faith is a different way of seeing. Matter of fact, my version or my definition of the word faith is simply seeing life through God's eyes. That's what faith is. Faith is seeing life through God's eyes. See, I don't live anymore. I, I, I spent too much of my life living through my natural eyes. I choose now to wake up every day. I don't, I don't discard reality or say, well, you just live in a fantasy world. No, I, and faith says I can take on mountains and valleys. I can go through whatever life brings me as long as I know who I am and who created me and who's with me. Faith is literally journeying through life through the eyes of God and not through your own eyes. It's such a better place to live. Now, if you have faith and maybe you've already given your life to Christ, well, let me tell you, once you get faith, faith alone by itself, the Bible says, is dead. Matter of fact, faith has to be tagged along with this thing called action. I love what we had in the hallway and on the video because here's the next part of the cycle. Once you have faith, the very next thing that faith has to move you to is to take next steps. Take next steps. And so here's my question. I believe everyone here, whether you're a well-seasoned Christian and you've been maybe saved longer than I've been alive, I would still challenge you, you have a next step to take. See, in the Christian life, you're either moving forward or moving backward. There's no just kind of chilling. You're either spiritually growing or you're spiritually dying. And the way that we spiritually grow is through taking next steps. And so my question is, what step do you need to take? 
What step of faith do you need to take? Because I know this, that without taking steps of faith, you will not grow. And I, this whole thing of confidence, you will not be confident until you take a step of faith. You will never know you can do something until you do it. And you've got to take steps of faith. And so you know what? If you're going to the gym to work out, how I many know you've got to take the weight? The only way to build muscle is through weight. The only way to build muscle is through tension, uh, it's through testing. And so if, if our muscles build through weight, how many know our faith? I believe faith is a spiritual muscle. It is a spiritual muscle, and it can grow. But the only way our spiritual muscle can grow is through weight, is through tension, is through testing, is through trials, is through difficult circumstances. And many of us, we avoid it. We, we say we don't want the weight. We don't want the testing. We don't want the tension. We don't want to run up the mountain. We don't want to conquer things for God. We, just, we are more comfortable staying where we are, but you will never grow where you are. You will never become who God's called you to be if you stay where you you are. You must take next steps. And a lot of these, are, they bring a lot of fear, but that's where faith comes in. You have to have faith to take next steps. So what is your next step? Uh, I'll reiterate the video. Maybe your next step is getting water baptized. What a powerful next step. And if you have never taken that next step, overcome your fear by faith and follow the obedience of Jesus and get baptized. Maybe your next step is getting in a small group that you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to overcome my fear uh, of making friends and building relationships because I know that we're better together we grow together. So I'm going to step out of my comfort zone and step into a small group. Maybe I'm going to step into serving on a team here that I'm so used to coming and just finding my seat and not helping out, not contributing. You know what? Maybe the next step for you is finding out how you can get on a team here. Maybe it's serving. Maybe it's greeting. Maybe whatever it is. Maybe you know that you have the gift to be on this stage and sing and lead people, but you're so afraid. Just take some next steps. Maybe it is giving. Maybe it's going on a trip. But how many know unless you take next steps, you're not going to grow? My place is that you're going to get to that place of confidence. You're going to see who God called you to be. But here's where it happens. When you take next steps, here's where it leads. Here's the final part. It leads to spiritual growth. It leads to spiritual growth. And that's where God called us to be. And spiritual growth leads to confidence. You will never be the confident person God called you to be if you don't first put your faith in God. Take the steps God's called you to take because taking those steps will absolutely lead to a place of spiritual growth. And here's what's going to be great. The more you take steps of faith, maybe for some of you it's just baby steps. But how I many know before long you're going to be signing up for stuff? You're going to get baptized. You're going to start giving for the first time. You're going to get in groups. And you're going to get more confident and more confident and before you're taking baby steps now you're taking giant steps of faith and you're going to be leading things and doing things you never thought I mean, if you would have told me five years ago that one day I would step out and start a church of my own it started with baby baby steps how I many know we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength but you got to take the first step you got to take the first step, and this is how we spiritually grow. Let me give you this verse in James chapter 1. I love this verse. It kind of sums this up for me. Let's persevere. Let's persevere. Let's not give up. Let's not quit. Let's not stay where we are. Let's let perseverance finish its work. It's the cycle. you got to be faithful. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be what? Mature and complete. Not incomplete and insecure, but confident and complete, not lacking in anything. You know, that's the way God wants you to be, not lacking anything. He created you. Go back to the original story. He knit you together for a purpose. And yet many of us are going through this crazy cycle of insecurity and fear and, and being uh, this thing of paralysis incomplete. God has called you to put your faith in the Jesus Christ that made you and that called you, that he has a plan for you. It's going to take faith. It's going to take steps. It's going to take spiritual growth. But then you're going to be someone who is mature and complete, not lacking anything. How many of you love for this verse to be attached to your name? Come on, that's what I want to be. I want to stand before God one day, and I want him to say, well done, my mature, my good, my faithful servant. You are who God called you to be. That's my prayer. You know, as we go through the Bible, I love this thing of mugshots because uh, many of us think that the people the Bible can't relate. Let, let me put this, let me go through two guys in particular. Let me put this guy's name up here. Uh, how many of you have heard of Moses before? Uh, how many of you know Moses has a mugshot? Come on, how many of you know Moses, the Bible says, was created by God, but he actually killed, uh, he killed an Egyptian. Remember, the Egyptians had the people of Israel in slavery, and he was so upset.
that, that one day this Egyptian was beating up one of his uh, people, and he actually murdered and killed, and what he was caught. So what did he do? He ran. He fleed to the desert. Now, let me put this crazy cycle up here, because uh, many years later, matter of fact, 40 years later, God called him to be who God called him to be. How remember when God created Moses? Remember the beginning of the story? How many know God saved him for a purpose? God didn't call him when he was 40 years old. God called him when he was in the mother's womb. God raised him up as a savior when he was first created. Yet when he was caught, that mugshot took him to the wilderness, took him to the desert. One day, you know the story, there was a burning bush where God Moses' attention and, and God says, Moses, don't you remember I called you? Now it's time to go set my people free. What did he say? I'm insecure, not me. Not me. I can't do it. What did he, what did he say? I have fear. What did that fear move him to? I, listen, I can't do it. You know why? I'm incomplete. I have a stuttering problem. I have a leadership problem. Maybe you can call somebody else. And Moses was stuck in this crazy cycle. But what did God say to him? God says, I am who I am. You are who I called you to be. He says, well, I just can't do it. Go to the good cycle. Because he said, you know what? I, I want you to have faith. Moses, what's in your hand? There's a staff. He says, just take a simple step. I'm not asking you to go to Egypt right now. Just go down and pick up. What was he doing? He was just trying to get Moses to take some steps of faith. Moses pick up the staff and when he did and he put it down it turned to a snake. When he picked it up it was a staff. What was he saying? And it, what was Moses doing? He was spiritually growing. He says just like you picked up the staff I'm going to be with you. What is that confidence? He goes now go. How many know he didn't go and just set the people free overnight? He went and he took baby steps. They were called different plagues. They got bigger and bigger but every time God came through, every time Moses took a step, he grew spiritually spiritually and to the point where just moments later he stood in front of an ocean or a sea and he took a next step and the entire thing opened up and he led over two million people out of bondage. How many know this works for Moses? It can work for you. If Moses was doing the crazy cycle. God helped him to get in the right way. Let me go to a New Testament guy. How many know this guy? Uh, one of the main followers of Jesus. His name was Peter. How many know Peter had a mug shot? How many know the Bible says that when Jesus needed him most, Peter denied him three times? How many know he was guilty. He was at his lowest moment. Matter of fact, let me show you the crazy cycle because this is what Peter lived. How many know Peter was very insecure? Matter of fact, he was so insecure that he was afraid. In the moment, he said, I will die for you. But in the moment, he was so afraid that when he was called upon, he was paralyzed in fear and he was lacking incomplete. He wasn't ready. But how many know, let me show the good cycle again because now we know that Jesus isn't done for us. How many know in our worst moments, God's not finished with us. He didn't write Peter off. Matter of fact, after the resurrection, who did he find? He went after Peter. He says, Peter, your name, what was he doing? He was speaking confidence into him. Your name is Peter. You are the rock. I'm going to build my church on you. He goes, you got to have some faith. Take some next steps. And what did Peter do? That's exactly what he did. He started taking steps of faith. He started following Jesus again. And he started to grow and grow and grow until the day of Pentecost came. Jesus ascended. It was Peter that stood up in front of thousands of people and preached the very first message that was ever preached in the modern church and over 3,000 people got saved, thousands of people healed people, set people free. This same coward became one of the bravest followers of Jesus. How many know he had confidence he was in the better cycle? How many know if God is for us, who can be against us? The same Peter that denied Jesus now is one of the greatest disciples that we know. Why? It all comes back to how we see ourselves. We see ourselves. Matter of fact, let me kind of end with this, and I, I want to close with this thought. Let me put this word up here, this word imagine, just for a second. If I can put that word up here. You know, I, I want to just, just do you to imagine something with me just for a second. Because when we think about my life, that was my life. I was in the crazy cycle for so long. For so long, I, I knew that God had called me to do stuff, but I never had the guts to take next steps. I never had faith because I was putting my faith. I saw myself through the eyes of myself and through other people. But finally, when I was 17, 18 years old, when I read that scripture in Psalms 1. 39, that God called me, God knit me together, God made me, it began to change everything about how I saw myself. Matter of fact, I want to take you back to that verse um, uh, at the end where it says that God literally wrote a book. How many saw that in Psalms 139? That when you were in your mother's womb, that God saw a book. Matter of fact, God ordained. What that word ordained means is he set a plan in motion. Matter of fact, I don't think God called me five years ago to start a church. I think God called me in my mother's womb that I would be a pastor and a leader. God wrote out every book. Now, I want you to imagine something with me. Now, this is imaginary. It can't happen. It's uh, uh, just it's impossible. 
possible, but let's just say today, I, want, I wonder if you could go back for some of us, uh, think, think about maybe if you're, if you're in your teens or 20s, maybe you go back five years, uh, uh, five years earlier of yourself, uh, I won't go any older than that, if you're, you just pick your own, but go back 10 years, 20 years, uh, if you could pick a time to go back uh, and maybe rewrite some things and tell yourself some things differently, you kind of pick that age, but I want you to imagine an earlier version of yourself. And I want you to imagine maybe walking into a Books a Million or a Barnes and Noble and you're kind of scrolling through some books and all of a sudden you're looking at the bestsellers and you're looking at the biographies that are written about people from somebody else's point of view. And all of a sudden, just imagine, I know it's not real, but just imagine you walked in and on the new releases, bestsellers, you see your mugshot on a book. Except it's not a bad picture, it's a great picture. And it's a book about you. And it's a book that was written by someone else, but it was a book about your life. And, and you picked up the book, and as you began to read it, you began to read about future events in your life. And I want you to imagine that you sat down and, and you were reading about some good things and some bad things, and, and you began to read a story that you couldn't believe. You got to the end, and you couldn't believe all the things that this book had to say about you and the things that you would do, the places you would go, the things that you would accomplish. And can you imagine walking out of that store knowing that that book was real? Somehow you got a hold of a future book about yourself. What kind of confidence would you have? What kind of faith would you have? Because even, how many know, some of you are in a bad place in your life right now, but if it was in a book, how many know every great story has a bad chapter? How many know every, every movie has a bad moment in it? And maybe you're in a bad place in your life, but you know what? It's just a chapter of the book. How many know that the end of your book is if you trust what I trust? How many know that this imaginary story, it's really real because God wrote a book about you? And if you know the end, how many know you win in the end every single time? You're victorious every single time. I can't imagine if I could go back 10, maybe 20 years. I wonder if I could go back 20 years if I was in Bible college, walked into Barnes and Noble, began to read a book. I wonder if I got to the chapter where it says that, that, you know, God called me to preach. And I thought, man, I never can imagine myself doing that. But I'm reading stories of me preaching and people coming to, to salvation or coming to faith. I, I wonder if I could read this book 20 years ago and read a chapter that God was going to bring the most amazing, the most beautiful woman ever in my life. And it's a picture book. So I saw a picture of her before I ever saw her. How many know if I knew that book, I would have not wasted any time with any other girls. I would have waited for the right person at the right time. But what if I read a chapter in that book where it says, years later I would start a church and on the first day literally 50 people would get saved five years later there'd be 2,000 people can you imagine the amount of faith and confidence I would live in my life if I could read that book before the truth is that book's already been written God put you together he knitted you he created you to do amazing things the problem is is that we rather pay attention to other people's promises other people's words other people's statuses than God's but I'm here to tell you that God made you God created you God wrote a book about you. It's time to start valuing God's words more than anybody else's words. How many ready to do that today? That's my prayer. That's my prayer. My prayer today is that you would see you the way God sees you. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes all across this place? I, I want to pray for you right now. And, and if you're here today, let me start by saying this. What's my first step? Well, if you don't know Jesus, that's your first step. You will never be confident until Jesus is in your life. You will always be in weakness or always be in arrogance. You will always be stuck in the crazy cycle until Jesus steps into the crazy cycle. And that's exactly what Jesus wants to do. He didn't come for perfect people. He came for sick people, for imperfect people. He came for you at your worst moment. And my prayer is today is maybe you think that there's a God that doesn't love you. He knows you by name. He wrote a book about you. He does know you. He loves you. He just wants you to begin the better cycle by putting faith in him, by putting faith in him. The Bible says there are no good people in heaven, just forgiven people. And I want you to know it's not about what you do. It's about who you know. Is Jesus Lord of your life? I want to pray a prayer with you, and it's more about your words than my words, but I want to lead you in a simple prayer. If that's you today, that's you today. You don't know if you die today where you're going. Would you just pray something like this? Just pray something like this. Jesus, I believe in you. I, I believe that you're the son of God. I believe you lived a perfect life because I never could. I believe you died on the cross to pay for the, my sin, which I should pay for, but you paid for it. They buried you, but you didn't stay there. You rose from the dead. You ascended to heaven. I believe that you are preparing a place for those who believe. And so now I believe. I pray that you would forgive me my sins, be Lord of my life. I'm taking the first step of faith to call you Lord, to say I'm tired of the crazy cycle. In Jesus' name, 
I pray. Now, God, I pray for all of us, believers and, and new believers, God, that are stuck in this crazy cycle. I pray for people here today that are insecure, people here today that are stuck in weakness, maybe playing it out through arrogance, but God, they're paralyzed by fear. They're incomplete. They're on the sidelines. They're reading someone else's book, watching someone else be who God called them to be. When they know that God made them, when they know that God has a plan for them. And so God, I pray that all of us would answer the question and say, what step of faith do I need to take? What step of faith? Is it a small group? Is it getting baptized? Is it giving? Is it joining a team? Is it going on a mission trip? Is it just being who God called me to be? Lord, I pray that we begin to take baby steps of faith that will lead to bigger steps, that will lead to a place of completion, of maturity. Would we spiritually grow? God, I pray that not just for individuals, I pray that for Inglewood. God, as Inglewood as a church, would you help them have faith to take on steps of faith? Would you take Inglewood to another place of spiritual growth? Would Inglewood be a church that is confident that you made them, that you called them, that you created them, that you have got amazing things in store for this church's future, not because of who they are, but because of who you are. So God, I pray that every person here, even if they walked in with a crazy view of themselves, would they now begin to see themselves the way you see them. May they start valuing their life through your eyes. And God, may they never be the same. And may they have perseverance that works the course. And may May the cycle continue in a better way and may they become that mature spiritual growing person that you've called them to be in Jesus name I pray and everybody said amen come on if you believe it can we just give God praise as your pastor comes God bless you guys it was a joy being with y'all today amen well as the ushers are going through this morning I want to do something special uh, I'm going to bring pastor Liz up some of you just wishing I would have preached so I would shut up but but um, but that's, that's all right I'm going to bring pastor Liz up this is pastor Liz Wilcox everybody give her a big hand uh, I, I I want to mention I want to mention something to you because I was thinking about this um, uh, Kelly pastor Brian's wife uh, when I was youth pastoring right out of college I was just a little bit older than or a little bit younger than Liz uh, I was in a little town called Lawson Missouri and we were really reaching students we had about a hundred kids in our youth group and and so we were constantly doing outreaches well one of the outreaches we did was was just free pizza we give away free pizza I mean no kids love pizza amen and so Kelly at the age of like 12 13 heard about this free pizza thing came in gave her heart to Christ uh, and now she's a pastor's wife doing great things. I, I mean, you know, God can do it, amen? He can save souls. Now now we go in and, and Jeannie, she's one of Jeannie's best friends. Well, uh, back in October, um, I really began to sense that we were going to have in the future a change in our youth ministry. We love Pastor Duro and Taylor, but I, I just sensed that, that their time in, in youth ministry was coming to an end in our church. And sure enough, about four or five months later, he resigned and, and they've gone on to do other things in another church. But uh, I, I knew in October that this change was coming. I just knew it in my spirit. I didn't tell anybody, but I knew it. And immediately God put somebody that was already on our team on my heart, Pastor Liz. I don't know if you know about this, but Liz graduated from our college. She's a licensed minister with the Assemblies of God. Uh, she's on my preaching team. She actually helps me develop my Sunday sermons. I've got a couple people to help me with that. And uh, she's just an awesome woman of God. Those of you that have history with Inglewood know the last time Inglewood had a large youth ministry, it was a girl leader. It was a single girl leader that was doing it and so uh, she went through a whole interview process uh, I tortured her for about two months uh, the board interviewed her and the Spirit of God just came in that room and said she is the one and so I want to introduce you to our new full-time youth pastor pastor Liz Wilcox and we're super excited we just know God's gonna do great things through her so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Liz head to the hallway. I'm going to have Pastor Brian and Kelly head to the hallway. And on your way out, I want you guys to greet Liz and, of course, greet Pastor Brian and Kelly and love on them. How many of you decided you're going to get behind this girl and we're going to see thousands of students reach for Christ through her ministry? Well, let's all stand. Let's all stand this morning. Thanks again for being a part of today. I know it was a little bit different. I'll be back in the pulpit for the next three weeks. Then I'm out one week, and then I'm back for like seven weeks. And so uh, God's got a lot of good things. Uh, coming for us. We're going to continue this series for three more weeks called Mugshot, looking at how God loves us at our worst. It's going to be an incredible time. Thanks again for being a part of church. God bless you guys. Have an awesome afternoon.